Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, Chapter 5, Origins of Freemasonry, by Nesta H. Webster, 1924. The origin of Freemasonry, says a Masonic writer of the 18th century, is known to Freemasons alone. If this was once the case, it is so no longer, for... Although the question would certainly appear to be one on which the initiated should be most qualified to speak, the fact is that no official theory on the origin of Freemasonry exists. The great mass of the Freemasons do not know or care to know anything about the history of their order, whilst Masonic authorities are entirely disagreed on the matter. Dr. Mackey admits that, quote, the origin and source whence first sprang the institution of Freemasonry has given rise to more differences of opinion and discussion among Masonic scholars than any other topic in the literature of the institution, end quote. Nor is this ignorance maintained merely in books for the general public since in those especially addressed to the craft and at discussions in lodges the same diversity of opinion prevails and no decisive conclusions appear to be reached. Thus, Mr. Albert Churchward, a Freemason of the 30th degree, who deplores the small amount of interest taken in this matter by Masons in general, observes, quote, Hitherto there have been so many contradictory opinions and theories in the attempt to supply the origin and the reason whence, where, and why the Brotherhood of Freemasonry came into existence, and all the different parts and various rituals of the different degrees. All that has been written on this has hitherto been theories, without any facts for their foundation." End quote. In the absence, therefore, of any origin universally recognized by the craft, it is surely open to the lay mind to speculate on the matter and to draw conclusions from history as to which of the many explanations put forward seems to supply the key to the mystery. According to the Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, no less than 12 theories have been advanced as to the origin of the order, namely, that Masonry derived, quote, number one, from the patriarchs, number two, from the mysteries of the pagans, number three, from the construction of Solomon's temple, number four, from the Crusades, number five, from the Knights Templar, number six, from the Roman Collegia of Artificers, number seven, from the Operative Masons of the Middle Ages, number eight, from the Rosicrucians of the 16th century, number nine, from Oliver Cromwell, number 10, from Prince Charles Stuart for political purposes, number 11, from Sir Christopher Wren, at the building of St. Paul's. Number 12, from Dr. de Sagulia and his friends in 1717. End quote. This enumeration is, however, misleading, for it implies that in one of these various theories, the true origin of Freemasonry may be found. In reality, modern Freemasonry is a dual system, a blend of two distinct traditions, of operative masonry, that is to say the actual art of building, and of speculative theory on the great truths of life and death. As a well-known Freemason, the Count Goblet de Aviela has expressed it, quote, Speculative masonry, that is to say the dual system we now know as Freemasonry, is the legitimate offspring of a fruitful union between the professional guild of medieval masons and of a secret group of philosophical adepts, the first having furnished the form and the second the spirit. End quote. 
In studying the origins of the present system, we have therefore, number one, to examine separately the history of each of these two traditions, and number two, to discover their point of junction. Part one, operative masonry. Beginning with the first of these two traditions, we find that guilds of working masons existed in very ancient times, without going back as far as ancient Egypt or Greece, which would be beyond the scope of the present work. The course of these associations may be traced throughout the history of Western Europe from the beginning of the Christian era. According to certain Masonic writers, the Druids originally came from Egypt and brought with them traditions relating to the art of building. The Chaldees, who later on established schools and colleges in this country for the teaching of art, sciences, and handicrafts, are said to have derived from the Druids. But a more probable source of inspiration in the art of building are the Romans, who established the famous Collegia of Architects referred to in the list of alternative theories given in the Masonic Cyclopedia. Advocates of the Roman Collegia origin of Freemasonry might be right as far as operative masonry is concerned. For it is to the period following on the Roman occupation of Britain that our Masonic guilds can with the greatest degree of certainty be traced. Owing to the importance the art of building now acquire, it is said that many distinguished men, such as St. Alban, King Alfred, King Edwin, and King Athelstan, were numbered amongst its patrons so that in time the guilds came to occupy the position of privileged bodies and were known as free corporations. Further than York was the first Masonic center in England, largely under the control of the Chaldees, who at the same period exercised much influence over the Masonic Collegia in Scotland at Kilwinning, Melrose, and Aberdeen. But it must be remembered that all this is speculation. No documentary evidence has ever been produced to prove the existence of Masonic guilds before the famous drug charter of AD 936, and even the date of this document is doubtful. Only with the period of Gothic architecture do we reach firm ground. That guilds of working masons known in France as Compagnonage and in Germany as Steinmetzen did then form close corporations and possibly possess secrets connected with their profession is more than probable. That, in consequence of their skill in building the magnificent cathedrals of this period, they now came to occupy a privileged position seems fairly certain. The Abbe Grandedier, writing from Strasbourg in 1778, traces the whole system of Freemasonry from these German guilds. Quote, this much bounded society of Freemasons is nothing but a servile imitation of an ancient and useful confrérie of real masons whose headquarters was formerly at Strasbourg and of which the constitution was confirmed by the Emperor Maximilian in 1498." End quote. As far as it is possible to discover from the scanty documentary evidence the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries provide, the same privileges appear to have been accorded to the guilds of working masons in England and Scotland, which, although presided over by powerful nobles and apparently on occasion at meeting members from outside the craft, remained essentially operative bodies. Nevertheless, we find the assemblies of masons suppressed by Act of Parliament in the beginning of the reign of Henry VI and later on an armed force sent by Queen Elizabeth to break up the annual Grand Lodge at York. 
it is possible that the fraternity merely by the secrecy with which it was surrounded excited the suspicions of authority, for nothing could be more law-abiding than its published statutes. Masons were to be, quote, true men to God and the Holy Church, end quote. Also, to the masters that they served, they were to be honest in their manner of life and, quote, to do no villainy whereby the craft or the science may be slandered, end quote. Yet, the 17th century writer Plod, in his Natural History of Staffordshire, expresses some suspicion with regard to the secrets of Freemasonry that these could not be merely trade secrets relating to the art of building, but that already some speculative element had been introduced to the lodges, seems the more probable from the fact that by the middle of the 17th century not only noble patrons headed the craft, but ordinary gentlemen entirely unconnected with the building were received into the fraternity. The well-known entry in the diary of Elias Ashmol under the date of October 16, 1646, clearly proves this fact. Quote, I was made a Freemason at Warrington in Lancashire with Colonel Henry Mainwaring of Cartisham in Cheshire. The names of those that were then of the lodge, Mr. Rich, Penket, Warden, Mr. James Collier, Mr. Rich Sankey, Henry Littler, John Ellum Rich, Ellum and Hugh Brewer, end quote. It is now ascertained, says Jarker, that the majority of the members present were not operative Masons. Again, in 1682, Ashmole relates that he attended a meeting held at Mason Hall in London where, with a number of other gentlemen, he was admitted into the Fellowship of the Freemasons, that is to say, into the second degree. We have then clear proof that already in the 17th century, Freemasonry had ceased to be an association composed exclusively of men concerned with building, although eminent architects ranked high in the order. Inigo Jones is said to have been Grand Master under James I, and Sir Christopher Wren to have occupied the same position from about 1685 to 1702. But it was not until 1703 that the Lodge of St. Paul in London officially announced, quote, that the privileges of masonry should no longer be restricted to operative masons, but extended to men of various professions, provided they were regularly approved and initiated into the order. End quote. This was followed in 1717 by the great coup d'etat when Grand Lodge was founded, and speculative masonry which we now know as Freemasonry, was established on the settled basis with a ritual, rules, and constitution drawn up in due form. It is at this important date that the official history of Freemasonry begins. But before pursuing the course of the order through what is known as the Grand Lodge era, it is necessary to go back and inquire into the origins of the philosophy that was now combined with the system of operative masonry. This is the point on which opinions are divided, and to which the various theories summarized in the Masonic Cyclopedia relate. Let us examine each of these in turn. Part 2. Speculative Masonry According to certain skeptics concerning the mysteries of Freemasonry, the system inaugurated in 1717 had no existence before that date, but, quote, was devised 
promulgated and palmed upon the world by Dr. Desaguliers, Dr. Anderson, and others, who then founded the Grand Lodge of England. End quote. Mr. Patton, in an admirable little pamphlet, has shown the futility of this contention and also the injustice of representing the founders of Grand Lodge as perpetrating so gross a deception. Quote, This 1717 theory ascribes to men of the highest character the invention of a system of mere imposture. It was brought forward with pretensions which its framers knew to be false pretensions of high antiquity, whereas it had newly been invented in their studies. Is this likely? Or is it reasonable to ascribe such conduct to honorable men without even assigning a probable motive for it? End quote. We have indeed only to study Masonic ritual, which is open to everyone to read, in order to arrive at the same conclusion, that there could be no motive for this imposture, and further than these two clergymen cannot be supposed to have evolved the whole thing out of their heads. Obviously, some movement of a kindred nature must have led up to this crisis. And since Elias Ashmole's diary clearly proves that a ceremony of Masonic initiation had existed in the preceding century, it is surely only reasonable to conclude that Drs. Anderson and Desaguliers revised but did not originate the ritual and constitutions drawn up by them. Now, Although the ritual of Freemasonry is couched in modern and by no means classical English, the ideas running through it certainly bear traces of extreme antiquity. The central idea of Freemasonry concerning a loss which has befallen man and the hope of its ultimate recovery is in fact no other than the ancient secret tradition described in the first chapter of this book. Certain Masonic writers indeed ascribe to Freemasonry precisely the same genealogy as that of the early Kabbalah, declaring that it descended from Adam and the first patriarchs of the human race, and thence through groups of wise men amongst the Egyptians, Chaldeans, Persians, and Greeks. Mr. Albert Churchward insists particularly on the Egyptian origin of the speculative element in Freemasonry. Quote, Brother Gold and other Freemasons will never understand the meaning and origin of our sacred tenets till they have studied and unlocked the mysteries of the past. End quote. This study will then reveal the fact that, quote, the Druids, the Gymnosophists of India, the Magi of Persia, and the Chaldeans of Assyria had all the same religious rites and ceremonies as practiced by their priests who were initiated to their order, and that these were solemnly sworn to keep the doctrines a profound secret from the rest of mankind. All these flowed from one source, Egypt, end quote. Mr. Churchward further quotes the speech of the Reverend Dr. William Dodd at the opening of a Masonic temple in 1794, who traced Freemasonry from, quote, the first astronomers on the plains of Chaldea, the wise and mystic kings and priests of Egypt, the sages of Greece, and philosophers of Rome, end quote, etc. But, how did these traditions descend to the Masons of the West? According to a large body of Masonic opinion in this country which recognizes only a single source of inspiration to the system we now know as Freemasonry, the speculative as well as the operative traditions of the order descended from the building guilds and were imported to England by means of the Roman Collegia. Mr. Churchward, however, strongly dissents from this view. Quote, In the new and revised edition of the Perfect Ceremonies, according to our e-working, 
A theory is given that Freemasonry originated from certain guilds of workmen which are well known in history as the Roman College of Artificers. There is no foundation of fact for such a theory. Freemasonry is now, and always was, an eschatology, as may be proven by the whole of our signs, symbols, and words, and our rituals. End quote. But what Mr. Churchward fails to explain is how this eschatology reached the working Masons. Moreover, why, if, as he asserts, it derived from Egypt, Assyria, India, and Persia, Freemasonry no longer bears the stamp of these countries. For although vestiges of Sabiism may be found in the decoration of the lodges, and brief references to the mysteries of Egypt and Phoenicia, to the secret teaching of Pythagoras, to Euclid, and to Plato in the ritual and instructions of the craft, the Greece, nevertheless, the form in which the ancient tradition is clothed, the phraseology and passwords employed, are neither Egyptian, Chaldean, Greek, nor Persian, but Judaic. Thus, although some portion of the ancient secret tradition may have penetrated to Great Britain through the Druids or the Romans, burst in the lore of Greece and Egypt, another channel for its introduction was clearly the Kabbalah of the Jews. Certain Masonic writers recognize this double tradition, the one descending from Egypt, Chaldea, and Greece, the other from the Israelites, and assert that it is from the latter source their system is derived. For after tracing its origin from Adam, Noah, Enoch, and Abraham, they proceed to show its line of descent through Moses, David, and Solomon. Descent from Solomon is in fact officially recognized by the craft and forms a part of the instructions to candidates for initiation into the first degree. But, as we have already seen, this is the precise genealogy attributed to the Kabbalah by the Jews. Moreover, modern Freemasonry is entirely built up on the Solomonic, or rather the Hiramic legend. For the sake of readers unfamiliar with the ritual of Freemasonry, a brief resume of this grand legend must be given here. Solomon, when building the temple, employed the services of a certain artificer in brass named Hiram, the son of a widow of the tribe of Nephtali, who was sent to him by Hiram, king of Tyre. So much we know from the Book of Kings, but the Masonic legend goes on to relate that Hiram, the widow's son, referred to as Hiram Abif and described as the master builder, met with an untimely end. For the purpose of preserving order, the masons working on the temple were divided into three classes, entered apprentices, fellow crafts, and master masons. The first two distinguish by different passwords and grips and paid at different rates of wages, the last consisting only of three persons, Solomon himself, Hiram, king of Tyre, who had provided him with wood and precious stones, and Hiram Abif. Now, before the completion of the temple, fifteen of the fellow crafts conspired together to find out the secrets of the master masons and resolve to waylay Hiram Aviv at the door of the temple. At the last moment, twelve of the fifteen drew back, but the remaining three carried out the failed design, and after threatening Hiram in vain in order to obtain the secrets, killed him with three blows on the head delivered by each in turn. They then conveyed the body away and buried it on Mount Moria in Jerusalem. Solomon, informed of the disappearance of the master builder, sent out fifteen fellow crafts to seek for him. Five of these, having arrived at the mountain, noticed a place where the earth had been disturbed, and there discovered the body of Iram, leaving a branch of acacia to mark the spot. They returned with their story to Solomon, who ordered them to go and exhume the body. 
an order that was immediately carried out. The murder and exhumation, or raising, of Iram, accompanied by extraordinary lamentation, form the climax of craft masonry. And when it is remembered that, in all probability, no such tragedy ever took place, that possibly no one known as Iram Abif ever existed, the whole story can only be regarded as the survival of some ancient cult relating not to an actual event, but to an esoteric doctrine. A legend and a ceremony of this kind is indeed to be found in many earlier mythologies. The story of the murder of Hiram had been foreshadowed by the Egyptian legend of the murder of Osiris and the quest for his body by Isis. Whilst the lamentations around the tomb of Iram had a counterpart in the mourning ceremonies for Osiris and Adonis, both, like Iram, subsequently raised. And later on in that which took place around the catafalque of Manes, who, like Iram, was barbarously put to death and is said to have been known to the Manichaeans as the son of the widow, but in the form given to it by Freemasonry, the legend is purely Judaic, and would therefore appear to have derived from the Judaic version of the ancient tradition. The pillars of the temple, Hashim and Boaz, which play so important a part in craft masonry, are symbols which occur in the Jewish Kabbalah, where they are described as two of the ten sephirots. A writer of the 18th century, referring to fiery curiosities, he has discovered in Scotland, described one as, quote, The mason word, which though some make a mystery of it, I will not conceal a little of what I know. It is like a rabbinical tradition in way of comment on Hashim and Boaz, the two pillars erected in Solomon's temple, with an addition delivered from hand to hand, by which they know and become familiar one with another. End quote. This is precisely the system by which the Kabbalah was handed down amongst the Jews. The Jewish Encyclopedia lends color to the theory of Kabbalistic transmission by suggesting that the story of Iram, quote, may possibly trace back to the rabbinical legend concerning the Temple of Solomon, end quote, that, quote, while all the workmen were killed so that they should not build another temple devoted to idolatry, Hiram himself was raised to heaven like Enoch, end quote. How did this rabbinic legend find its way into Freemasonry? Advocates of the Roman Collegiate theory explain it in the following manner. After the building of the Temple of Solomon, the Masons who had been engaged in the work were dispersed and a number made their way to Europe, some to Marseille, some perhaps to Rome, where they may have introduced Judaic legends to the Collegia, which then passed on to the Comancini masters of the 7th century, and from these to the medieval working guilds of England, France, and Germany. It is said that during the Middle Ages, a story concerning the Temple of Solomon was current among the Compagnonages of France. In one of these groups, known as the Children of Solomon, the legend of Iram appears to have existed much in its present form. According to another group, the victim of the murder was not Iram Abif, but one of his companions named Maitre Jax who, whilst engaged with Iram on the construction of the temple, met his death at the hands of five wicked fellow crafts, instigated by a sixth, the Père Soubise. But the date at which this legend originated is unknown. Clavel thinks that the Hebraic mysteries existed as early as the Roman Collegia, which he describes as largely Judaized. Jarker expresses precisely the opposite view. Quote, it is not so difficult to connect Freemasonry with the Collegia. The difficulty lies in attributing Jewish traditions to the Collegia. And we say on the evidence of the oldest charges that such traditions had no existence in Saxon times. End quote. Again, quote, 
So far as this country is concerned, we know nothing from documents of a masonry dating from Solomon's temple until after the Crusades, when the constitution believed to have been sanctioned by King Atelstan gradually underwent a change. End quote. In a discussion which took place recently at the Quater Coronati Lodge, the Hiramic legend could only be traced back, and then without absolute certainty, to the 14th century, which would coincide with the date indicated by Jarker. Up to this period, the lore of the Masonic guilds appears to have contained only the exoteric doctrines of Egypt and Greece, which may have reached them through the Roman Collegia. Whilst the traditions of masonry are traced from Adam, Jabal, Tubal, Cain, from Nimrod, and the Tower of Babel, with Hermes and Pythagoras as their more immediate progenitors. These doctrines were evidently in the main geometrical or technical, and in no sense cabalistic. There is therefore some justification for Eckert's statement that, quote, the Judeo-Christian mysteries were not yet introduced into the Masonic corporations. Nowhere can we find the least trace of them. Nowhere do we find any classification, not even that of masters, fellow crafts, and apprentices. We observe no symbol of the Temple of Solomon. All their symbolisms relate to Masonic labors and to a few philosophical maxims of morality. End quote. The date at which Eckert, like Jarker, places the introduction of these Judaic elements is in time of the Crusades. But whilst recognizing that modern craft masonry is largely founded on the Kabbalah, it is necessary to distinguish between the different Kabbalahs, for by this date no less than three Kabbalahs appear to have existed. Firstly, the ancient secret tradition of the patriarchs handed down from the Egyptians through the Greeks and Romans and possibly through the Roman Collegia to the craft masons of Britain. Secondly, the Jewish version of this tradition, the first Kabbalah of the Jews, in no way incompatible with Christianity, descending from Moses, David and Solomon to the Essenes and the more enlightened Jews. And thirdly, the perverted Kabbalah mingled by the rabbis with magic, barbaric superstitions, and, after the death of Christ, with anti-Christian legends. Whatever Kabbalistic elements were introduced into craft masonry at the time of the Crusades appear to have belonged to the second of these traditions, the unperverted Kabbalah of the Jews, known to the Essenes, there are, in fact, striking resemblances between Freemasonry and Essenism, degrees of initiation, oaths of secrecy, the wearing of the apron, and a certain Masonic sign, whilst to the Sabius traditions of the Essenes may perhaps be traced the solar and stellar symbolism of the lodges. The Hiramic legend may have belonged to the same tradition. Part 3. The Templar Tradition if then no documentary evidence can be brought forward to show that either the Solomonic legend or any traces of Judaic symbolism and traditions existed either in the monuments of the period or in the ritual of the Masons before the 14th century, it is surely reasonable to recognize the plausibility of the contention put forward by a great number of Masonic writers, particularly on the continent, that uh, the Judaic elements penetrated into Masonry by means of the Templars. The Templars, as we have already seen, had taken their name from the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. What then more likely than that during the time they had lived there, they had learned the rabbinical legends connected with the Temple? According to George Sand, who was deeply versed in the history of secret societies, the Hiramic legend was adopted by the Templars as symbolic of the destruction of their order. Quote, they wept over their impotence in the person of Hiram. The word lost and recovered is their empire. End quote. The Freemason Ragon likewise declares that the catastrophe they lamented was the catastrophe that destroyed their order. Further, the Grand Master whose fate they deplored was Jacques Dumoulay. Here then we have two bodies in France at the same period, 
the Templars and the Compagnonage, both possessing a legend concerning the Temple of Solomon, and both mourning a Maistre Jax, who had been barbarously put to death. If we accept the possibility that the Hiramic legend existed amongst the Masons before the Crusades, how are we to explain this extraordinary coincidence? It is certainly easier to believe that the Judaic traditions were introduced to the Masons by the Templars and grafted onto the ancient lore that the Masonic guilds had inherited from the Roman Collegia. That some connection existed between the Templars and the working Masons is indicated by the new influence that entered into building at this period. A modern Freemason comparing, quote, the beautifully designed and deep-cut marks of the true Gothic period, say circa 1150-1350, end quote, with, quote, the careless and roughly executed marks, many of them mere scratches of later periods, end quote, points out that, quote, the Knights Templars rose and fell with that wonderful development of architecture, end quote. The same writer goes on to show that some of the most important Masonic symbols, the equilateral triangle and the mason square surmounting two pillars, came through from Gothic times. Jarker asserts that the level, the flaming star, and the Tau cross, which have since passed into the symbolism of Freemasonry, may be traced to the Knights Templar, as also the five-pointed star in Salisbury Cathedral, the double triangle in Westminster Abbey, Hashim and Boaz, the circle and the pentagon in the Masonry of the 14th century. Jarker cites later, in 1556, the eye and crescent moon, the three stars, and the ladder of five steps as further evidences of Templar influence. Quote, the Templars were large builders, and Jacques du Molay alleged the seal of his order in decorating churches in the process against him in 1310. Hence, the alleged connection of Templary and Freemasonry is bound to have a substratum of truth. End quote. Moreover, according to a Masonic tradition, an alliance definitely took place between the Templars and the Masonic Guild at this period. During the proceedings taking against the Order of the Temple in France, it is said that Pierre d'Amont and seven other knights escaped to Scotland in the guise of working masons and landed in the island of Mall. On St. John's Day, 1307, they held their first chapter. Robert Bruce then took them under his protection, and seven years later they fought under his standard at Bannockburn against Edward II, who had suppressed their order in England. After this battle, which took place on St. John the Baptist Day in summer, June 24, Robert Bruce is said to have instituted the Royal Order of HRM, Heredom, and Knights of the RSYCS, Rosy Cross. These two degrees now constitute the Royal Order of Scotland, and it seems not improbable that in reality they were brought to Scotland by the Templars. Thus, according to one of the early writers on Freemasonry, the degrees of the Rose Croix originated with the Templars in Palestine as early as 1188. Whilst the eastern origin of the word Heredom, supposed to derive from a mythical mountain on an island south of the Hebrides, where the Chaldees practiced their rites, is indicated by another 18th century writer who traces it to a Jewish source. In the same year of 1314, Robert Bruce is said to have united the Templars and the Royal Order of HRM with the guilds of working masons, who had also fought in his army at the famous Lodge of Kilwinning, founded in 1286, which now added to its name that of Heredon and became the chief seat of the order. Scotland was essentially a home of operative masonry and, in view of the Templars' prowess in the art of building, what more natural than that the two bodies should enter into an alliance? Already in England, the temple is said between 1155 and 1199 to have administered the craft. 
It is thus at the head of them of Kilwinning, quote unquote, the holy house of masonry, quote unquote, Mother Kilwinning, as it is still known to Freemasons, that a speculative element of a fresh kind may have found its way into the lodges. Is it not here then that we may see that, quote, fruitful union between the professional guild of medieval masons and a secret group of philosophical adepts, end quote, alluded to by Count Goblet de Aviella and ascribed by Mr. Waite in the following words, quote, the mystery of the building guilds, whatever it may be held to have been, was that of a simple, unpolished, pious, and utilitarian device. And this daughter of nature, in the absence of all intention on her own part, underwent or was coerced into one of the strangest marriages which has been celebrated in occult history. It so happened that her particular form and figure lent itself to such a union, etc. End quote. Mr. Wade, with his usual vagueness, does not explain when and where this marriage took place. But the account would certainly apply to the alliance between the Templars and Scottish guilds of working masons, which, as we have seen, is admitted by Masonic authorities and presents exactly the conditions described. The Templars, being particularly fitted by their initiation into the legend concerning the building of the Temple of Solomon to cooperate with the Masons, and the Masons being prepared by their partial initiation into ancient mysteries to receive the fresh influx of Eastern tradition from the Templars. A further indication of the Templar influence in craft masonry is the system of degrees and initiations. The names of entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason are said to have derived from Scotland, and the analogy between these and the degrees of the assassins has already been shown. Indeed, the resemblance between the outer organization of Freemasonry and the system of the Ismailis is shown by many writers. Thus, Dr. Bossel observes, quote, no doubt, together with some knowledge of geometry regarded as an esoteric trade secret, many symbols today current did pass down from very primitive times. But a more certain model was the Grand Lodge of the Ismailis in Cairo, end quote. A further indication of the Templar influence in craft masonry is the system of degrees and initiations. The names of entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason are said to have derived from Scotland, and the analogy between these and the degrees of the assassins has already been shown. Indeed, the resemblance between the outer organization of Freemasonry and the system of the Ismailis is shown by many writers. Thus, Dr. Bossel observes, quote, No doubt together with some knowledge of geometry regarded as an esoteric trade secret, many symbols today current did pass down from very primitive times. But a more certain model was the Grand Lodge of the Ismailis in Cairo, end quote. That is to say, the Dar ul Hikmat. Syed Amir Ali also expresses the opinion that, quote, Macrisi's account of the different degrees of initiation adopted in this lodge forms an invaluable record of Freemasonry. In fact, the lodge at Cairo became the model of all the lodges created afterward in Christendom. End quote. Mr. Bernard Springett, a Freemason, quoting this passage, adds, quote, In this last assertion, I am myself greatly in agreement. End quote. It is surely therefore legitimate to surmise that this system penetrated to craft masonry through the Templars, whose connection with the assassins, offshoot of the Dar ul Hikmat, was a matter of common knowledge. The question of the Templar succession in Freemasonry forms perhaps the most controversial point in the whole history of the Roman Collegia theory, continental masons more generally accepting it and even glorifying in it. Mackey, in his lexicon of Freemasonry, thus sums up the matter. Quote, the connection between the Knights Templar and the Freemasons has been repeatedly asserted by the enemies of both institutions, and has often been admitted by their friends. 
Lori, on this subject, holds the following language, quote within quotes. We know that the Knights Templar not only possessed the mysteries but performed the ceremonies and inculcated the duties of Freemasons, end quote within quotes. And he attributes the dissolution of the order to the discovery of their being Freemasons and their assembling in secret to practice the rites of the order, end quote. This explains why Freemasons have always shown indulgence to the Templars. Quote, it was above all Freemasonry, says Findel, which, because it falsely held itself to be a daughter of Templarism, took the greatest pains to represent the order of the Templars as innocent and therefore free from all mystery. For this purpose, not only legends and unhistorical facts were brought forward, but maneuvers were also resorted to in order to suppress the truth. The Masonic rebearers of the Temple Order bought up the whole edition of the Acts du Process of Moldenhauer, because this showed the guilt of the Order, only a few copies reached the booksellers. Already several decades before, the Freemasons, in their unhistorical efforts, had been guilty of real forgery. Dupuy had published his History of the Trial of the Templars as early as 1654 in Paris, for which he had made use of the original of the Acts to Process, according to which the guilt of the order leaves no room for doubt. But when, in the middle of the 18th century, several branches of Freemasonry wished to recall the Templar order into being, the work of Dupuy was naturally very displeasing. It had already been current amongst the public for a hundred years, so it could no longer be bought. Therefore, they falsified it." End quote. Accordingly, in 1751, a reprint of Dupuy's work appeared with the addition of a number of notes and remarks and mutilated in such a way as to prove not the guilt but the innocence of the Templars. Now, although British masonry has played no part in these intrigues, the question of the Templar succession has been very inadequately dealt with by the Masonic writers of our country. As a rule, they have adopted one of two courses. Either they have persistently denied connection with the Templars, or they have represented them as blameless and cruelly maligned order. But in reality, neither of these expedients is necessary to save the honor of British Masonry. For not even the bitterest enemy of Masonry has ever suggested that British Masons have adopted any portion of the Templar heresy. The knights who fled to Scotland may have been perfectly innocent of the charges brought against their order. Indeed, there is good reason to believe this was the case. Thus, the Manuel de Chevalier del Ordre du Temple relates the incident in the following manner. Quote, after the death of Jacques du Molay, some Scottish Templars, having become apostates at the instigation of Robert Bruce, ranged themselves under the banners of a new order instituted by this prince, and in which the receptions were based on those of the Order of the Temple. It is there that we must seek the origin of Scottish masonry and even that of the other Masonic rites. The Scottish Templars were excommunicated in 1324 by L'Armenu, who declared them to be Templi Desertores and the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, Dominiorum Militiae Spoliatores, placed forever outside the pale of the temple, Extrahirum Templi Nunc et in Futurum Volo Dico et Jubeo. A similar anathema has since been launched by several grand masters against Templars who were rebellious to legitimate authority. From the schism that was introduced into Scotland, a number of sects took birth. End quote. This account forms a complete exoneration of the Scottish Templars as apostates from the bogus Christian Church and the doctrines of Johannism, they showed themselves loyal to the true church and to the Christian faith as formulated in the published statutes of their order. What they appeared then to have introduced to masonry was their manner of reception, that is to say, their outer forms and organization, and possibly certain Eastern esoteric doctrines and Judaic legends concerning the building of the Temple of Solomon in no way incompatible with the teachings of Christianity. 
It will be noticed, moreover, that in the band passed by the Ordre du Temple on the Scottish Templars, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem are also included. This is a further tribute to the orthodoxy of the Scottish Knights. For to the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, to whom the Templar property was given, no suspicion of heresy had ever attached. After the suppression of the Order of the Temple in 1312, a number of the Knights joined themselves to the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, by whom the Templar system appears to have been purged of its heretical elements. As we shall see later, the same process is said to have been carried out by the Royal Order of Scotland. All this suggests that the Templars had imported a secret doctrine from the East, which was capable either of a Christian or an anti-Christian interpretation, that through their connection with the Royal Order of Scotland and the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, this Christian interpretation was preserved, and finally that it was this pure doctrine which passed into Freemasonry, According to early Masonic authorities, the adoption of the two St. John's as the patron saints of Masonry arose, not from Johannism, but from the allegiance between the Templars and the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. It is important to remember that the theory of the Templar connection with Freemasonry was held by the continental Freemasons of the 18th century, who, living at the time the order was reconstituted on its present basis, were clearly in a better position to know its origins than we, who are separated from that date by a distance of 200 years. But since their testimony first comes to light at the period of the upper degrees, in which the Templar influence is more clearly visible than in craft masonry, it must be reserved for a later chapter. Before passing on to this further stage in the history of the craft, it is necessary to consider one more link in the chain of the Masonic tradition, the quote-unquote Holy Bem. Part 4. The Vem Gerichts these dread tribunals, said to have been established by Charlemagne in 772 in Westphalia, had for their about object the establishment of law and order amidst the unsettled and even anarchic conditions that then reigned in Germany. But by degrees, the power arrogated to itself by the Holy Femme became so formidable that succeeding emperors were unable to control its workings and found themselves forced to become initiates from motives of self-protection. During the 12th century, the Femme Gerichts, by their continual executions, had created a veritable Red Terror, so that the east of Germany was known as the Red Land. In 1371, says Lacetulux de Cantelou, a fresh impetus was given to the Holy Femme by a number of Knights Templar who, on the dissolution of their order, had found their way to Germany and now sought admission to the secret tribunals. How much of Templar lore passed into the hand of the Femme Gerichts, it is impossible to know but there is certainly a resemblance between the methods of initiation and intimidation employed by the Femmes and those described by certain of the Templars, still more between the ceremony of the Femmes and the ritual of Freemasonry. Thus, the members of the Femmes, known as the Vicende or Enlightened, were divided into three degrees of initiation, the Free Judges, the Veritable Free Judges, and the Holy Judges of the Secret Tribunal. The candidate for initiation was led blindfold before the Dread Tribunal, presided over by a Stuhlherr, or Master of the Share, or his substitute, a Freigraf with a sword and branch of willow at his side. The initiate was then bound by a terrible oath not to reveal the secrets of the Holy Femme, to warn no one of danger threatening them by its decrees, to denounce anyone, whether father, mother, brother, sister, friend, or relation, if such a one had been condemned by the tribunal. After this, he was given the password and grip by which the confederates recognized each other. In the event of his turning traitor or revealing the secrets confided to him, his eyes were bandaged, his hands tied behind his back, and his tongue was torn out through the back of his neck, 
after which he was hanged by the feet till he was dead, with the solemn imprecations that his body should be given as a prey to the birds of the air. It is difficult to believe that the points of resemblance with modern Masonic ritual which may here be discerned can be a mere matter of coincidence, yet it would be equally unreasonable to trace the origins of Freemasonry to the them Gerichts. Clearly, both derive from a common source. Either the old pagan traditions on which the early Thems were founded or the system of the Templars. The latter seems the more probable for two reasons. Firstly, on account of the resemblance between the methods of the Vemgerichts and the assassins, which would be explained if the Templars formed the connecting link. And secondly, the fact that in contemporary documents the members of the secret tribunals were frequently referred to under the name of Rose Croix. Now, since, as we have seen, the degree of the Rosy Cross is said to have been brought to Europe by the Templars, this would account for the persistence of the name in the Femgerichts as well as in the Rosicrucians of the 17th century who are said to have continued the Templar tradition. Thus, Templarism and Rosicrucianism appear to have been always closely connected, a fact which is not surprising since both derive from a common source, the traditions of the Near East. This brings us to an alternative theory concerning the channel through which Eastern doctrines, and particularly Kabbalism, found their way into Freemasonry. For it must be admitted that one obstacle to the complete acceptance of the theory of the Templar succession exists, namely that although the Judaic element cannot be traced further back than the Crusades, neither can it with certainty be pronounced to have come into existence during the three centuries that followed after. Indeed, before the publication of Anderson's Constitutions in 1723, there is no definitive evidence that the Solomonic legend had been incorporated into the ritual of British Masonry. So, although the possession of the legend by the Compagnonage of the Middle Ages would tend to prove its antiquity, there is always the possibility that it was introduced by some latter body of adepts than the Templars. According to the partisans of a further theory, these adepts were the Rosicrucians. Part 5. Rosicrucian Origin one of the earliest and most eminent precursors of Freemasonry is said to have been Francis Bacon. As we have already seen, Bacon is recognized to have been a Rosicrucian, and that the secret philosophical doctrine he professed was closely akin to Freemasonry is clearly apparent in his New Atlantis. The reference to the quote-unquote wise men of the Society of Solomon's House cannot be a mere coincidence. The choice of Atlantis, the legendary island supposed to have been submerged by the Atlantic Ocean in the remote past, would suggest that Bacon had some knowledge of a secret tradition descending from the earliest patriarchs of the human race whom, like the modern writer Le Plongeon, he imagined to have inhabited the Western Hemisphere and to have been the predecessors of the Egyptian initiates. Le Plongeon, however, places this early seat of the mystery still further west than the Atlantic Ocean in the region of Majax and Yucatan. Bacon further relates that this tradition was preserved in its pure form by certain of the Jews who, whilst accepting the Kabbalah, rejected its anti-Christian tendencies. Thus, in this island of Ben Salem, there are Jews, quote, of a far different disposition from the Jews in other parts. For whereas they hate the name of Christ and have a secret inbred rancor against the people amongst whom they live, these uh, contrarywise keep on to our Savior many high attributes, end quote. But at the same time, they believe, quote, that Moses, by a secret Kabbalah, ordained the laws of Ben Salem, which they now use. 
am that when the Messiah should come and sit on his throne at Jerusalem, the king of Ben Salem should sit at his feet, whereas other kings should keep at a great distance. End quote. This passage is of particular interest as showing that Bacon recognized the divergence between the ancient secret tradition descending from Moses and the perverted Jewish Kabbalah of the rabbis, and that he was perfectly aware of the tendency even among the best of Jews to turn the former to the advantage of the messianic dreams. Miss Pott, who in her Francis Bacon and his Secret Society, sets out to prove that Bacon was the founder of Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry, ignores all the previous history of the secret tradition. Bacon was not the originator but the inheritor of the ideas on which both these societies were founded and the further contention that Bacon was at the same time the author of the greatest dramas in the English language and that the chemical marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz is manifestly absurd. Nevertheless, Bacon's influence amongst the Rosicrucians is apparent. Haydon's voyage to the land of the Rosicrucians is in fact a mere plagiarism of Bacon's New Atlantis. Miss Pott seems to imagine that by proclaiming Bacon to have been the founder or even a member of the Order of Freemasonry, she is revealing a great Masonic secret which Freemasons have conspired to keep dark. But why should the craft desire to disown so illustrious a progenitor or seek to conceal his connection with the Order if any such existed? Findel indeed frankly admits that the New Atlantis contained unmistakable allusions to Freemasonry and that Bacon contributed to its final transformation. This was doubtless brought about largely by the English Rosicrucians who followed after. To suggest then that Freemasonry originated with the Rosicrucians is to ignore the previous history of the secret tradition. Rosicrucianism was not the beginning but a link in the long chain connecting Freemasonry with far earlier secret associations. The resemblance between the two orders admits of no denial. Thus, Jarker writes, quote, The symbolic tracing of the Rosicrucians was a square temple approach by seven steps. Here also we find the two pillars of Hermes, the five-pointed star, sun and moon, compasses, square and triangle, end quote. Jarker further observes that, quote, even Wren was more or less a student of Hermeticism, and if we had a full list of Freemasons and Rosicrucians, we should probably be surprised at the numbers who belong to both systems, end quote. Professor Bühle emphatically states that, quote, Freemasonry is neither more nor less than Rosicrucianism as modified by those who transplanted it into England, end quote. Chambers, who published his famous Cyclopedia in 1728, observes, quote, Some who are no friends to Freemasonry make the present flourishing society of Freemasons a branch of Rosicrucians, or rather the Rosicrucians themselves under a new name or relation, these as retainers to building. And it is certain there are some Freemasons who have all the characters of Rosicrucians." End quote. The connection between Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism is, however, a question hardly less controversial than that of the connection between Freemasonry and Templarism. Dr. Mackey violently disputes the theory. Quote unquote, the Rosicrucians, he writes, quote, as this brief history indicates, had no connection whatever with the Masonic fraternity. Notwithstanding this fact, Barruel, the most malignant of our revilers, with a characteristic spirit of misrepresentation, attempted to identify the two institutions, end quote. But the aforesaid quote-unquote brief history indicates nothing of the kind, and the reference to Barruel as a malignant reviler for suggesting a connection which, as we have seen, many Freemasons admit, shows on which side this quote-unquote spirit of misrepresentation exists. 
It is interesting, however, to note that in the eyes of certain Masonic writers, connection with the Rosicrucians is regarded as highly discreditable. The fraternity would thus appear to have been less blameless than we have been taught to believe. Mr. Waite is equally concerned with proving that there, quote, is no traceable connection between Masonry and Rosicrucianism, end quote. And he goes on to explain that Freemasonry was never a learned society, that it never laid claim to, quote, any transcendental secrets of alchemy and magic or to any skill in medicine, end quote. The truth may lie between the opposing contentions of Professor Bule and his two Masonic antagonists. The Freemasons were clearly, for the reasons given by Mr. Waite, not a mere continuation of Rosicrucianism, but more likely borrowed from the Rosicrucians a part of their system and symbols which they adapted to their own purpose. Moreover, the incontrovertible fact is that in the list of English Freemasons and Rosicrucians, we find men who belong to both orders, and amongst these, two who contributed largely to the constitutions of English Freemasonry. The first of these is Robert Flood, whom Mr. Waite describes as, quote, the central figure of Rosicrucian literature, an intellectual giant, a man of immense erudition, of exalted mind and, to judge by his writing, of extreme personal sanctity. Anna Moser describes him as one of the most distinguished disciples of Paracelsus, and, quote, Jarker adds this clue, quote, in 1630, we find Flood, the chief of the Rosicrucians, using architectural language, and there is proof that his society was divided into degrees, and from the fact that the Mason's Company of London had a copy of the Masonic charges presented by Mr. Flood, we may suppose that he was a Freemason before 1620, end quote. A still more important link is Elias Ashmole, the antiquary, astrologer, and alchemist, founder of the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford, who was born in 1617, an about Rosicrucian, and, as we have seen, also a Freemason, Ashmole displayed great energy in reconstituting the craft. He is said to have perfected its organization, to have added to it further mystic symbols, and according to Ragon, it was he who drew up the ritual of the existing three craft degrees, entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason which was adopted by Grand Lodge in 1717. Whence did these fresh inspirations come but from the Rosicrucians? For, as Ragon also informs us, in the year that Ashmol was received into Freemasonry, the Rosicrucians held their meeting in the same room at Mason Hall. How, then, can it be said that there was, quote, no traceable connection between Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism, end quote, and why should it be the part of a, quote, unquote, malignant reviler to connect them? It is not suggested that Rosicrucians, such as Flood and Ashmol, imported any magical elements into Freemasonry, but simply the system and symbols of the Rose Croix with a certain degree of esoteric learning that Rosicrucianism forms an important link in the chain of the secret tradition is therefore undeniable. Part 6. The 17th Century Rabbis There is, however, a third channel through which the Judaic legends of Freemasonry may have penetrated to the craft, namely the rabbis of the 17th century. The Jewish writer Bernard Lazar has declared that, quote, there were Jews around the cradle of Freemasonry, end quote. And if this statement is applied to the period preceding the institution of Grand Lodge in 1717, it certainly finds confirmation in fact. Thus, it is said that in the preceding century, the coat of arms now used by Grand Lodge had been designed by an Amsterdam Jew, Jacob Jehuda Leon Templo, 
colleague of Cromwell's friend, the Kabbalist Manasseh ben Israel. To quote a Jewish authority on this question, Mr. Lucien Wolf writes that Templo, quote, had a monomania for everything relating to the Temple of Solomon and the Tabernacle of the Wilderness. He constructed gigantic models of both these edifices, end quote. These he exhibited in London, which he visited in 1675 and earlier, and it seems not unreasonable to conclude that this may have provided a fresh source of inspiration to the Freemasons who framed the Masonic rituals some 40 years later. At any rate, the Masonic coat of arms still used by Grand Lodge of England is undoubtedly of Jewish design. Quote, unquote, this coat, says Mr. Lucian Wolf, quote, is entirely composed of Jewish symbols, end quote, and is, quote, an attempt to display hierarchically the various forms of the cherubim pictured to us in the second vision of Ezekiel, an ox, a man, a lion, and an eagle, and thus belongs to the highest and most mystical domain of Hebrew symbolism. End quote. In other words, this vision known to the Jews as the Merkaba belongs to the Kabbalah, where a particular interpretation is placed on each figure so as to provide an esoteric meaning not perceptible to the uninitiated. The Masonic coat of arms is thus entirely Kabbalistic as is also the seal on the diploma of craft masonry, where another Kabbalistic figure, that of a man and woman combined, is reproduced. Of the Jewish influence in masonry after 1717, I shall speak later. To sum up, then, the origins of the system we now know as Freemasonry are not to be found in one source alone. The twelve alternative sources enumerated in the Masonic Cyclopedia and quoted at the beginning of this chapter may all have contributed to its formation. Thus, operative masonry may have descended from the Roman Collegia and through the operative masons of the Middle Ages, whilst speculative masonry may have derived from the patriarchs and the mysteries of the pagans. But the source of inspiration which admits of no denial is the Jewish Kabbalah. Whether this penetrated to our country through the Roman Collegia, the Compagnonage, the Templars, the Rosicrucians, or through the Jews of the 17th and 18th century, whose activities behind the scenes of Freemasonry we shall see later, is a matter of speculation. The fact remains that when the ritual and constitutions of Masonry were drawn up in 1717, although certain fragments of the ancient Egyptian and Pythagorean doctrines were retained, the Judaic version of the secret tradition was the one selected by the founders of Grand Lodge on which to build up their system.